like I was unsure if I was going to be racing. I was unsure if I could afford it. And that was really hard to come around to, I guess. But at the same time, because like I moved on to GNBN and like I had a different goal to focus on and now I was becoming like a presenter on their channel, that gave me like something completely different to focus on. And it got to a point where I was like, right, I either need to be focused on being a racer or I need to just take this presenter thing and go with it and try and be the best like presenter I can be, learn how to do, learn how to work with the cameras. And that was like a whole new skill set to develop. Cause I never, I never like got a, a training course or a lesson or anything like that. It was all just self-taught. Hello and welcome to the Contact Collectors Derailed Podcast. This week I have a new set. It is in my kitchen slash living room. Uh, I just went to get a different seat, one that kind of swivels a little bit because these kitchen chairs, you know, you're quite kind of small and wooden and a little bit hunched over. So this is more of a, you know, presenting chair, office chair. Does both nine to five and you know post nine to five. Does anyone? Anyway. Uh, does it all? I thoroughly recommend them. I don't know which brand this is. Possibly Staples or some such. Um, but you can get them everywhere. They're they're, they're quite they're quite popular um, and for good reason. They're good. You swivel before swivel chairs. People were just kind of not swiftly, um, which was, you know, probably worse. I wouldn't really know. Uh, I've only ever, well, I do have some experience. <laughs> anyway, cheers aside this week, uh, I am talking to Scott Lockland. Uh, Scott is a good friend of the Contour Collective. We've known him for quite some time. Uh, Hutch used to race with him. I remember him from, you know, my first races at the SDAs, the Scottish Downhill races and, and such like. Um, and we chat, we had a really great and interesting conversation. Um, we talked about just sort of his background in riding, why he likes to ride, what got him into it, what his sort of early inspirations were, what he originally wanted to achieve with the sport. We talk about how he got into presenting um, and working with GMBN. Uh, and perhaps most interestingly, for me at least, we talk about his view on the impact that social media is having on mountain biking and sport at large. Uh, Scott obviously has a very positive view of it, being you know uh, someone with a big following on social media and, and YouTube. Um, and I think, yeah, he brought up some really interesting points. His view is it's made the sport more accessible. It's got, you know, it's... Uh, it's got a lot more people into the sport. One of the reasons we're seeing so many people now mountain biking and doing all sorts of different sport uh, is because of social media. And it's something I hadn't really given an awful lot of thought to before. You just sort of think, oh, more people are getting into it because they just are. But there's actually, you know, there's reasons for this. And perhaps social media, as much as, you know, there's problems with it and people criticize it for X, Y, or Z, um, is actually a part of what's getting more people into the sport. So... I really hope you enjoy the conversation. If you do, please like, comment, and subscribe. It would be greatly appreciated. Uh, but otherwise, we're going to jump in now to my conversation with Scott Lockland. I really hope you enjoy it. Um, and see you in the outro. Well, I'll also be in the conversation. Uh, but we'll see you again in the set, in the outro, with this set. See you later. All right. We're ready. <laughs> Finally, longest, longest start to a podcast so far. Scott, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are we doing? Good, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm glad to glad to get started now. <laughs> how's, your, how's your winter been? Winter's been pretty good. Um, I've been trying to ride a lot. I've been e-biking a lot and got a couple of really good ski days in, actually. Where about have you been skiing? Just, the Just on the local hills. Just on the on the Oakle hills which are like local to me they're they're pretty small i think the highest one is about 550 meters um and they're just super short ski runs like 30 seconds to a minute runs but it was just nice to do something different and 
you know, see the hills covered in white and go up there and I guess break up the normality of just riding and working and stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, I actually got to do the same in the in the Pentlands. Yeah, when it was when it was snowy. Do you have a pair of touring skis? Yeah, I got a full a full setup about two years ago now. Pretty lucky that Scott also do skis and stuff. Um, do they do boots and stuff as well? Uh, they do boots, they do helmet, jacket, like everything. Pretty much everything apart from, or maybe they do do skins. I'm not sure if they, anyway, when I got skis, I couldn't get Scott skins. Um, and yeah, it's a pretty solid setup, man. They're probably a little bit yeah. wide for Scotland. They're like 115s. Yeah. They're like proper <laughs> cargo skis. Yeah. But it was Some good. It was it. so nice just to get some snow sports in. Absolutely. Yeah, Scott's a great sponsor in that way because they pretty much make, ev- I mean, they make everything to do with outdoor stuff, don't they? Do they have motocross? They have running. They have cycling, snow sports. Like, pretty well covered. Yeah, absolutely. You got you got one, and you you got them all basically with with uh, with Scott. How have you been? Uh, how have you found? How have you been coping with lockdown? Uh, start with just like this last lockdown through, through the winter and then i'll ask you about about the other one um pretty okay there's definitely been times where it's just the like monotony is pretty hard like i'd like to just go somewhere like, i have really good trails here in sterling um we're lucky enough that we've got some mountains like a little bit further north but yeah just it's just nice to just leave like your home area and go somewhere new and ride some different trails so it's been good but definitely there's been a few days i think like everyone that you just want to you just want to go somewhere new you want to like get that sense of adventure get back out there and go ride something different yeah absolutely how do you think uh how did you what were your thoughts thoughts on the on the first one because a lot of your job is you know traveling around and uh and doing different stuff so quite a change of pace How, how did you find it I think in the start, I just took it on board because that's all that you could do. And like, it was like two weeks, three weeks. And you thought, okay, this is going to come to an end. And then it went on and on. And you just kind of, I don't know, in some ways, do you know what? It was really nice for the last probably 10 years. I've spent a lot of time traveling, going new places, which has been awesome. But I've never stopped and stayed in one place, chilled out, probably like caught up in sleep, caught up in just relaxing activities and in that sense it's been really nice but i have definitely missed like traveling and gaining new experiences yeah yeah absolutely um okay i'll i want to talk to you about everything basically I wanna, let's we'll start with uh your your background in the sport um how did you get into writing got into riding um so i started off riding trials i had a pw50 when i was like five years old which is like a little peewee motocross bike transitioned into trials had a ty80 loved it um and then we're reading i think it was a newspaper an article came up about the fort william world cup in 2002 which was the very first ever one Stu thompson he was like a local hero in trials he transitioned to mountain bike and he was in the newspaper talking about um, the World Cup. And I was like, ah, that sounds pretty cool. So we went along to the World Cup to go and watch it. And then from there, it was just like pretty natural progression where you could go up to the woods. It was really easy, like riding motorbikes pretty hard because you've got to go somewhere, you've got to drive somewhere. Like it requires a lot more time to get ready to go. Whereas on the mountain bike, you can just jump on it, leave your garage and be and be somewhere. And I think that's what really kicked off was I could go every day after school up to the woods. I could hit the jumps. I could build jumps. Um, and it was just a place where like creativity, I guess, could really grow. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Greg Callahan said the same thing. He started uh, with motor trials. But he was saying, I'd imagine this would be similar for yourself, that the problem with motor trials was he needed his, he didn't have as much independence, like he needed his dad, you know, to take him. So he could only go when his dad was going, whereas a mountain bike was something that he could just go off himself. Was that, is that the same for you? Yeah, no, totally, 100%. Like, if I didn't have my dad there, I couldn't go. We didn't have anywhere local to ride. 
or we had places local, but you'd have to drive 15 minutes. And when you're 11 years old, obviously you can't do that. And you can't just be like, Hey, take me. I want to go trials riding right now. Like, so yeah, I guess, exactly. I guess, yeah, a hundred percent needed someone to take me. And, um, yeah, that's where mountain biking really kicked off. So got into it that year, which was 2002, 2003. Dude, yeah, it makes me feel really old. <laughs> that's 18 that's years old. ago. It's funny because even for me, like, I'm like, you're old, man. <laughs> but I suppose I got into it just a, like a few years later, like 2005, 2006, which is, you know. You've yeah, been... do you know what? This, this is the first year ever that i've actually started to feel old. like i'm looking at all the kids throughout the woods doing what i was doing at their age <laughs> yeah. and being like why is there litter on the ground like what are they doing like building these berms and it's probably exactly the same thing that the older mountain bike generation were like these kids man what are they doing <laughs> it's funny actually because i've been thinking exactly the same thing probably especially because there's more people cycling and, and lockdown and everything but i've been thinking i'm getting old because i just i like i find it so heartwarming to see like I just knew, you know, it was such an amazing thing for us as teenagers and like young people to, as you say, like off our own back, just we could cycle up to this. Like we went up to Kostorfin Hill in Edinburgh and um, and we just had the whole world up there. That was just our kingdom. And we would, you know, we basically were up there every day, like building trails and, and what, it was just such an amazing escape and thing to have. And it's, it's so, I'm just like, I don't know, I feel quite distant from seeing those those people now. I'm like 10 years older than like or more and i just think like oh, that's so cool there's a there's like the new the new generations coming in you know i know and it's like cool because they're probably going through exactly the same thing i don't know about what the trail scene was like in edinburgh but every night we'd spend all day digging we'd build these like sick jumps would like build up to making bigger and bigger doubles and then we'd come the next day and all the logs have been pulled out the jumps have been trashed so we'd build them up again but they'd be bigger and it's that like but I think that's what like built me as a mountain biker is like, right, they're not going to ruin our fun. So we just build them bigger every day. And it was like the, I guess like practice makes perfect from it. So you'd be like building up, getting bigger and bigger. And then you just like start expanding the whole line around as well. And that Absolutely. was probably like, I don't know, I was probably like 16 at that age. And that really kicked off the whole mountain bike thing for me. Yeah. Totally. And where were you riding? Where did you grow up? Uh, so I grew up in Sterling. Um, so we've got like the mine woods, we've got Demaya, um, and like obviously the big ones, Canvas Bar. And I think like, you know, around then a lot of people were really riding there. Like you had Stu Thompson was using it a lot. He was building jumps there. Dave Mack was through, Rui Cunningham was through all the time. And the scene was just kind of like exploding and really growing. Mm, around Sterling. Except. Yeah. It's so, like Canvas Barn and stuff as well. Or you were you riding around there? Yeah, and it's got like good downhill trails. It's got good dirt jumps. Just had a bit of everything. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think the what was the scene like back then, and how do you think it compares to what it's like now? I mean, everyone would have been riding different bikes, I suppose, for for a start. I think the scene back then was, you know, it was really welcoming. It was really friendly. And um, I first did an, a Scottish downhill race in, I think it was two thousand and three. And I just remember that basically anyone would kind of open their arms to you and let you come and ride and stuff. And I think progressively as it's gone on and the more competitive people have got with it, it's become a bit more serious hmm. and probably more closed off. Whereas back then it was just about riding. It was about having fun and like all just training down the hill. And yeah, I don't know. I've not been to a race for a while, but that's definitely the impression or the vibes I get from it. I'm sure it's think, still really really fun but yeah i think the scottish downhills were really great such a f they still are i mean they're just smaller now and just no one's really doing them anymore but like when i did my first in 2008 or 9 i remember i mean i'm sure you remember this as well like the entries went in like four or five minutes i remember i didn't get into the first one and i was so upset because i'd missed this entry i didn't realize it was going to like nothing i can't think of I just entered an EWS and it didn't go that quickly. There was so much demand. And then the, the races were just, this, they were, they felt like a big deal and they were such a great atmosphere. Dude, you're having like some of the world's best coming to Scotland to ride in these, like, I guess like it's just a national series and they were super fun. It was probably still when you're like using dial-up kit 
connection too. You'd have to plug your like laptop in and be like, okay, seven o'clock, race entries go live. And you'd be like watching the clock. Seven would come up, you'd be straight on it, ready yeah, to go. It was hard. It was you had to be really paying attention. What like, do, you think? do you remember people like do you remember people like the vibe as well? Like just there for like a good time. Like if you were staying on the race site, you'd be like they'd be partying till like one, two o'clock, bonfires, beers, just having a wicked time. Yeah, it was it was so much fun. I do think they're they are still I love the SDAs. Like they're just a fun I think this, the enduro races are the same. The British downhill races were a very different, a very different, like, vibe. A lot more serious, uh, you know, I think. But the Scottish races were always just, yeah. were so much fun. I guess, though, like, there's just more competition there, isn't there? It's, it's wider spread. There's more people. There's probably more up for grabs from it as well. So with that, I guess, brings, like, a lot more, a lot more focus and seriousness. Absolutely. I'm sure as well, the like, you know, Pierce cycles, the sort of smaller, more regional races in England had a similar, similar kind of fun, relaxed vibe to the, to the SDAs. I mean, it'd be like saying, yeah, like obviously as you go higher up, it gets more serious, you know, what, what do you think? Well, why do you think you started riding? Like what was the sort of, what was pulling you towards these sort of more, I don't know, thrill seeking kind of sports? I don't really know. I think I'd always been, well, I'd always been introduced to two wheels, like from, from a young age, like I'd been on that PW50 from the age of probably like four or five. And yeah, I don't know what really like pulled me into it. I think I just, as soon as I tried it, I was just hooked on it. I loved it. I loved being in the woods, like being with the boys, like digging jumps, seeing that progression. Um, and the progression was, was like really good at that point and we we're all egging each other on trying to become better riders and I think that really helped and I see that very similarly now with my skiing like I'm quite new to skiing and like every time I go out on skis or every time I do a run I'm like oh I did that a little bit better and like just getting that little bit it's like I don't know how you describe it but getting better at something you want to keep doing it it's like the adrenaline pushes you to become better push yourself a little bit more and I think that's what biking really gave me. It was just like becoming the best in, in myself and pushing my personal limits. And I loved that. Mm. Yeah, watching, I mean, there is something very satisfying and almost quite addictive about, it could be anything as well. Like I've been like converting my van the last few months and learning how to do electrics. And at first it's horrible. And then, you know, you start to get your head around it and it's so satisfying that like you can apply that, you know, to anything. Um, yeah, that is that is uh it's definitely it's like a the, big part of it it's like the puzzle of it all like trying to make it all come together and like work it all out and then when you finally work it out it's like the satisfaction of like completing it. it's like the final piece in the jigsaw do you know what i mean like mm, absolutely and when you're racing i guess you're always looking for that perfect run there is also like you'd always have a goal to win like every racer i guess goes there to do their best or to win the race and like when you get that perfect run or like you do really well it was like a, it was a pretty unbeatable feeling i think absolutely yeah why do you think you started racing i think the it gave my riding a purpose i think you know like rather than just going up the woods and and dirt jumping or or riding it was like it had a real purpose there and it was good fun like it was you know, like what we're, we're talking about the SDAs there, it was, it was so much fun. Like it became like part of, part of your life where you'd be doing uplift days, you'd be doing like practice days. Then the races, there was like, what, six, seven of them a year. And it was just like a big meeting and you built friends there. And then I guess that like just grew the whole thing where then you'd meet up with one person one weekend, another, another. And it was just really fun. And then it just carried on developing. Yeah, the problem solving as well of racing is you've got obviously each individual race and then you've got each off season as well. And the whole time, you know, you've got this like dream of, you know, making it mountain biking or whatever, doing what you love. And, but it's so all consuming and quite, it is, as you say, like very satisfying because you're like, right, this one, if I can just improve this, you know, I'll get a little bit better. Okay, this off season, I'm, I'm going to work on this. It adds so much more. I think for certain, like, for people so inclined, like, would you say you're quite a, would you say you're quite a competitive person? 
yeah, quite competitive and, and definitely driven. Like, I, dude, I really, I think I did like a little mini like documentary thing this last week as a video. And like one of the questions was like, if you could go back, like say 15 years and change one thing, like what would it be? And I was probably like, probably have more fun racing, like not take it just like, not focusing on that outcome of like winning but just being there in the moment having really good time and probably with that would have brought the results but because you're like result driven focused on like that single outcome you kind of forget about all the like little bits and make up that final outcome goal absolutely yeah and and i think especially in a sport like downhill it's uh being relaxed and and not being too outcome focused and having fun 100 percent makes you a, a faster rider I, I was in my race and i got way too serious and obsessive because i felt like the least the less fun i have the more likely i'm gonna i'm gonna make it you know the more i sacrifice the more likely i'm gonna make it and it does not work <laughs> no as soon as you start putting pressure on yourself or like i guess if you put like a target on there like you're like it's much harder. Like I have so much admiration for people like Gwen and Minar who like handle that pressure so well. And like they, they outrightly say that like their thing is to go and win, you know, and Gwen's like admitted that he loves like winning. Like that's just what he loves doing. And like, I think that's like really, really cool to, to be able to do that, pull it off and handle the pressure. Yeah, totally. Like those guys have, something something kind of like special about them um for sure they're just like separate them from from everyone else well what were some of the highlights of your because you i mean you raced very seriously as you're saying for quite a few years i looked on your roots and rain just before this you've done 100 147 races uh which is like you know you've done a lot of races so what what were the, some of that some of the highlights for you i think the highlight was always fort william world cup like just it was just so cool, man. All the people there cheering, wanting you to do well. Um, I guess the three highlights for me would definitely be Fort William World Cup. Um, there's a BDS at Fort William, and it's, it's probably one of the few race runs that I've ever managed to, like, nail and be like, that was, like, that was, a mo- that was everything just came together in that moment. And I think I got, like, sixth or seventh fastest time of the day. And... Um, one expert category which at that time was really like really competitive and just yeah had a had a mega run just everything came together all the lines i'd planned just executed perfectly like and it was just so so good yeah um and another one was at dunkel's like dunkel's just one of my favorite tracks it was tacky and yeah just really really fun was that uh was that a, a scottish race or a british race then Scottish, I think it was Scottish champs. I'm pretty sure. That's interesting. And you just another just great run, you nailed it. Yeah, just everything clicked, man. Just just like one of those few moments where just, you know, you I think when you're having a good race run, there's nothing else in your head. Like the only thing that you're thinking about is like the track ahead of you. Hitting your lines. Like you're not even thinking about hitting your lines, you're just doing them. You're in this like really weird space where it's just everything feels really slow and i've only ever found it a few times and it's like it's it's just mad it is it's it's really fun i kind of still miss there's something about racing downhill that was just like awesome like i miss the feeling of being just you know exhausted and you're just going as fast you're going basically just a bit beyond (laughs) the edge and you're just and like you get so exhausted sometimes like i've got this particular memory just racing in months and that i you i remember like not even caring i was so tired i didn't even care if i crashed like i was like so exhausted but there's something cool about about that feeling dude you're just hanging on to the bike just like, yeah <laughs> please get me to the bottom like I can, I can mentally do this physically i just need to be able to hold on to the bike and then it's gonna be sweet yeah, that's what it feels like. It feels like you're hold it's like you're holding on to a horse or like a buckaroo ride or something. You're not even you're not even controlling it anymore. You're just actually just getting thrown around by this bike that you're just allowing to go. It's like absolute top speed. Yeah, no, there is something 
like there is something really special about downhill. I don't ever know if I found that same feeling when I was racing enduro. I think because the intensity is not as high. Like when you're racing downhill, like your focus is like 120%. And I'm not saying that it's not an enduro, but it is definitely a different different feeling. I think because you're preserving yourself or you know there's a climb or there's a piece that you need to attack. You're never giving it full gas. And like downhill bikes, man, they're still just, they are still the sickest bike. Like just being able to absolutely go like hard on them and just absolutely just fly into things the geometry the suspension the tires everything there's something really rad about them yeah and just the the racing format itself like spectators on track you know exactly what's going on like you finish your run and you know exactly where you are you're, you're seeing everything happen live you know as it as it unfolds um how do you see like because when we started racing i mean the mountain biking certainly the racing side of mountain biking has changed massively since we started racing you know with it was like you had a cross-country bike a downhill bike um and everyone was racing downhills the sdas were going in like four minutes or something um and now obviously enduro is uh, is the is the major participation sport anyway there's still a lot of people watching downhill but what's your take on on how mountain biking has changed since since you got into it I don't know. I, do you know what's cool is just seeing more people out on bikes. Like we we're talking a little bit about this before the podcast properly kicked off, but I think it's really nice to see more people like just accepting mountain biking as a sport generally. Like I think probably you know social media has really helped with growing the sport as a whole and taking it to the masses and you know viral videos going massive and reaching not just mm. people who ride but other people. And then with the whole lockdown thing, people wanting to gain new experiences, but the experiences that they have are like pretty closed, I guess. So like they look at new sports or look at new ways of exploring and the bike is a pretty obvious one. You can go so far on it now. You can go to new places. Like, I mean, I'm always meeting people who are like, you know, the bike is so good. It's taking me places. Um, and they're just loving it. And I think that's what's really cool about the way the sports growed. I'm kind of out of touch with like the whole racing scene and what the actual like events are like nowadays. But it's probably been, I think, five years since I was competing in one. Mm-hmm. But I think, you know, from the outside, they look really, they look really cool. Um, but just seeing the amount of people who are in the sport now, it's, it can only be good really for the industry as a whole yeah that's a really good point actually because as what's changed the racing is the bikes and those bikes the bikes that we're all riding now are infinitely like the reason we all ride downhill bikes was because it was the only bike that you could like shred a trail on whereas now we ride these bikes like i was riding um the rain uh, um just out uh riding the other day and it was like it was so capable of riding these like fast, rough trails. It was as capable as my as my downhill bike was. And it, it kind of it was just like especially twenty niners. Like it just kind of blew my mind. I was like, I haven't ridden these trails since I was on a downhill bike and this thing is and I just cycled up here, it was easy. From a participation standpoint, it is there's no doubt that it's better. Dude, you only really need one bike now. You know, like when we were when we were riding and racing, everyone would pretty much have like a cross country kind of it would be like, we'd call it cross country. No one would call it enduro or trail or anything. It would be like a cross country bike. There would probably be like a hybrid spec to like have like wider bars, shorter stem. And then everyone would have a downhill bike. And now when you actually look at the downhill bikes, you go back like 15 years ago, the downhill bike that I was racing on is like the same as my Ransom, 170 mil, like 65 degree head angle. Um, I got 29 inch wheels instead of 26 inch disc rotors have remained pretty much the same size like it's pretty crazy really yeah it really is and they have it definitely it makes it I suppose slightly more accessible well it makes like having like going fast on the like the sense a bit more accessible because everyone can you can ride up and come down on, on the same stuff and you can ride lots more different types of trails so you can go to different places um yeah it has widened widened up the sport 
bikes to Christ. Dude, and then you bring in e-bikes to the equation where like, you know, people who perhaps wouldn't have ever wanted to climb to the top of a trail are now like able to get to the trail, ride down and have the same like feelings that we have, for example, like the same enjoyment. Like I was chatting to a guy yesterday out riding and he had a he had an e-bike. And he was basically saying how much he was loving it. Like he's not in shape. He used to find it really hard going down to like Glen Tress or somewhere and doing a doing like one lap up to like maybe Buzzard's Nest or Spooky Woods. And like after that, he'd be totally dead. Now he'll do three laps and have the absolute time of his life and go back with a massive smile on his face and not be completely like deflated and tired. And I was like, mm. that's like that's like the perfect scenario for like someone who's new into mountain biking, why they get an e-bike. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting because I've probably, I don't know if you've been the same, but had a quite a sort of pretentious and probably kind of elitist view of e-bikes, maybe slightly taken for granted as well. The fact that, you know, I've been riding for so long and also like just been training for so long. So like, I kind of see the fitness side of things as like, I, I hold it in, probably too high a regard especially for the everyday rider who doesn't care <laughs> about these silly things that you know me and Christo compete about or you know whatever um and actually e-bikes are it's they're gonna get I think even I can imagine like people in my like my brothers or something who wouldn't be up for I've got one brother in particular that wouldn't <laughs> that wouldn't be up for for cycling up a hill but if I was to say like oh Laura you want to come out on an e-bike or my girlfriend's the same like like they'd be much more inclined as that guy is and most people are, that's, that opens up to a lot more people, not just sort of fitness enthusiasts or, or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, like I was talking to Glenn Thompson, I did a lot of filming with him and we're chatting and he's like, oh man, I kind of want to get into biking, like want to get back into riding, get back in shape. But like, you know, it's like, it's quite a hard starting point, really. Like you have to put really a lot of time in to get to a place where you're comfortable riding trails. And we're like, like the e-bike is a perfect scenario for that because you could go to Glen Tress and you could lap things over and over. You could work on improving things. Each lap, you could become better and better. Whereas if you're on a normal bike, that might be like two or three weekends worth of riding up, mm. down. Whereas like an e-bike, you're like up, down, up, down, up, down in that same same time frame. Yeah, and I bet too, I remember looking at some study, I don't know how much more research has been done into it but i think lewis kirk was actually looking into this in the last time i spoke to him um the difference of like how much like you know your average heart rates of like that guy who wouldn't be inclined because what it's doing for someone like him is he's getting his exercise on the way down as opposed to the way up and he's going down more often which is making him do it and because it's more sort of fun whereas if he didn't have any bike he'd be you know be slogging up the hill for 40 minutes and then one trip down and then wouldn't really want to go back up the hill. So it'd be interesting to know if there's even much of a difference in terms of exercise or a workout between the e-bikes and, and the normal bikes for these people. Yeah, I guess in the downhills, you're like the bike is just naturally heavy. So you're working harder, but on the, like on the uphills, when I've been looking at like, like a Garmin or something and looking at heart rates, it's, it is significantly lower than if I was on a normal bike, but you're still at that like kind of lower end where you're building a base. So it's only a good thing, really. It's not as if you're just sitting there, like literally doing nothing. You've still got to work it. It's mm. not as if you just, you know, throttle on and you're being cruised up the hill. Yeah, totally. I'm better than sitting on the couch or, or anything. And the more technical the climb is, the more effort it takes. Like I've run some really like, techy stuff on the e-bike climbing like put it in trail or put it in boost and like you're like seriously working totally yeah yeah to go back then to to racing a little bit um how do you look back on your years racing now that you've got some we've done a lot of these podcasts with racers and people that are still in their racing and for me like I have a bit of distance between when I was racing and now, and I think I, you can see things in a way that you can't while you're while you're still racing. So how how do you look back on on those years racing? Uh, I think I look back on them really really fondly. It's like what I said to you earlier. I wish I just probably chilled with it a little bit more and um, kind of like 
run the course of it rather than getting really worked up about like performance or getting wound up about not like hitting something right or, or getting the wrong line. Um, but yeah, I look back at it with good memory. It's like, I say I don't want to race, but then at times, there's definitely times where like I miss just that like intense focus and that like reason to go from like A to B like as quick as you can. Yeah, yeah, totally. What do you, what do you miss about it? Like other than just, just that, I missed. Sorry, go on. Just that like adrenaline, man. Just like feeling like there's nothing else going on in your head because you're like so focused on just that like section in front of you that you're not thinking mm. about like, okay, that I've got to do this on Monday morning or something. You're, there's just nothing else going in your head because you're you're that focused and you're that invested in it that if you if you're not focusing to that level then you're in then you're in trouble pretty quickly i think yeah totally do you miss the training at all no i don't think so i think i loved really? the training at the time but i definitely don't miss like the the actual training i like i like the training when i had it and the structure helped but i don't miss i don't miss having that like you know, 6 a.m. you've got to do this or you've got to eat this or be like this. Um, but, like, I do, I do miss, like, being, like, in that really high-end physical fitness feel. Like, you know, when you're, when you know that you can just sprint out a section or when you know coming sections that you can just hold on and you're not going to be, like, I guess I don't really not feel that now, but, you know, that just having that extra, like, little, I don't know what you'd call it, like five, ten percent just in the bank just to boost you that a little bit more. But I definitely don't miss like having to go to the gym or do intervals or Any like <laughs> Yeah. Why did you why did you stop racing? Um stop racing. I don't really know. I think it was just the opportunity that came. Like I got the opportunity to join GMBN. Um, like my time with Cube came to an end. I had two years with them. Um, and like, dude, I think pro racing is pretty hard. Like I, I was never in a position where I was making anything from it. I'd get bikes, I'd get expenses paid for. That's awesome. But like the older that you get, there's only so long that you can do that for. And I definitely wanted to have a degree of independence um, away from my parents. And they're huge supporters. Um, yeah, I mean, I, it just kind of came up to an end just because of it. Um, mm. The opportunity with GMBN came up. Cube offered me like a different opportunity. It wasn't really for me. And then GMBN just kind of worked out. And that kind of just paved like a whole new chapter in my career. And something, that I, I guess, looking back on racing, something I never thought I'd be doing before. Yes, I definitely want to talk to you about more on that but just bef before we go into that i wondered if you found it because like when i stopped racing uh i just stopped because i didn't care anymore just suddenly like all this intensity all this drive to do well at races just like i was at the start line um somewhere and i just i was like i don't i don't actually care how how i do in this race and that was such a foreign feeling uh and at first it was it was confusing because you know for so long it was literally as you say, you're, it's, it's so consuming. That's what's nice about it. It's all I was thinking about all the time. It was like my attention was fully taken up with racing. Uh, and then when that like left, I actually found it really difficult for a few years, kind of like just finding like my kind of just working out what to think about again, basically. Do you know what? Uh, like, was it, was it hard for you when you stopped? I don't think so. Cause like, well, yes and no. Like, I think when the when the EWS contract came to an end, I still had the like the want to go racing. I still wanted to go to the events and go and ride and and push myself. But it was almost as if like not having the the support and the sponsors taken away, it was like really hard to find the motivation to be like, right, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to go and do these intervals. I'm going to go and do laps of this trail. I'm going to do all these things because it was all just like I was 
unsure if I was going to be racing. I was unsure if I could afford it. And that was really hard to come around to, I guess. But at the same time, because like I moved on to GNBN and like I had a different goal to focus on and now I was becoming like a presenter on their channel, that gave me like something completely different to focus on. And it got to a point where I was like, right, I either need to be focused on being a racer mm. or I need to just take this presenter thing and go with it and try and be the best like presenter I can be, learn how to do it, learn how to work with the cameras. And that was like a whole new skill set to develop. Cause I never, I never like got a, a training course or a lesson or anything like that. It was all just self-taught. Mm. That's interesting. So yeah, you just went straight from one exciting kind of focus to another one. Yeah. Like there is no break. There is, I don't know, dude, I think it was probably the best thing for me because I still had that like intense thing to focus on that I wanted to get better at, but yeah. Yeah. But you were getting paid this time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like that was like the first eight weeks I was on like a, don't know it was just like a, this is how much you'd be paid kind of thing and i was like what this is crazy like i'm actually getting money for the first time like a, yeah like actual money to go and like do something that's in, involved with biking totally. and like that was that, that to me was like pretty amazing mm. how did that opportunity come around then how did with gmbn at that time they were just looking for like pro or ex-pro racers to work on the channel and I've known Neil like or I knew of Neil kind of thing through racing and he just sent me a either a text or a message or a DM or something at that time it was like hey like would you be interested in potentially coming on a trip to Spain with us and I was like yeah sure like I at that point I didn't have any like real partners firmed up or really have any plans for the following year and he was like you can come to I think we went to um Spain we went to Malaga that's where we went for three weeks and I was like dude for sure I have no other plans like I'd love to go and ride somewhere dry like I've not really got any money that I could pay for my own way to go and do like riding in the in the dry terrain and I was like yeah let's do it and um it just kind of went from there where like it went really well for like a trial period which was I think four weeks to getting offered like a full-time job yeah that's that is that's cool how did you find because like gmbn caters for like a very different audience than you know cube bikes like the race team does so how did you find the transition from being a sort of pro racer in a in a quite almost completely different field in, in some regards to then being on this channel that is much more catered towards like everyday riders and stuff how, how was that transition for you um it was do you know what it was pretty easy like i've always enjoyed getting people into mountain biking and encouraging and giving tips and stuff and we had a lot of creative freedom really like we were allowed to kind of create the videos that we thought were interesting and for me certainly at the very beginning it was just exciting to be riding my bike getting paid for it we got like loads of opportunities to go new places and it was exciting and like, you know, like the whole, the whole thing of being in front of the camera and like working out how to make better videos was, was also really interesting to me. I'd, I'd never had an opportunity really to work on that side of things and, you know, how to talk to a camera for one, it's, it's like a bit of a skill in itself. And especially back then, because social media was still kind of gradually growing, there weren't like there weren't many people doing YouTube stuff at all really then that's like, that's pretty much four, four and a half, five years ago. Um, and obviously it's like taken off now completely. So it was a bit of a niche and it was just a cool journey, man. There was people that I was watching, people that I started to really like following. Um, and just having that creative freedom was what kept it going, I guess. Mm. Were you making your own videos then for them? Like, were you doing the filming or were they sending uh, someone to do the filming? No, we had a, there was always a filmer and someone who would edit it. I had the job of like coming up with the idea, scripting it, presenting it. It does, it sounds like a great, it does sound like a great fun job. 
yeah no it was good like i had like definitely what about a year and a half of really really good times and and then i kind of felt like i'd got to a point with it and i wanted to do stuff on my own they're also based down in bath and like i wanted to be up in scotland with friends family everyone was up here like the writing scene is really good here and i just i was coming back like every weekend or every other weekend and it's like a six hour drive or an hour and a half flight mm-hmm. and that just had its toll on me and i was just like you know what i'd like to have a crack of it in my own way like travel more have my own like creative freedom see what i can do for myself and be up here in scotland and that's kind of what i went on to do mm. what do you think then you took from from gmbn or what did you what did you learn there just the i guess what i really took was being able to present in front of camera like having that understanding of like how to present yourself or or like even come up with video ideas think of like unique things and and also what you can do with um, companies and brands and like how you can actually work with sponsors whereas i guess before going to gmbn i had like really no idea what you know i could offer sponsors like i thought racing was like a really good package i'd be like hey i'm gonna race ews these are my goals for this year but even though i was doing these things i wasn't offering them anything in return apart from going to the races and and the occasional bit of press coverage which you know probably wasn't of much value and at the time i was like i don't understand why they don't want to like support or why they but i just didn't realize what like sponsorship was about and how to get it in the right ways i think that's a big one that was something me and dan wolf talked about a lot on our podcast was like kind of the attitude of a lot of young racers probably just like certainly i was in that category i don't don't know about you but i didn't even like didn't even want to get involved in social media or anything i was just like no like i'm just just about the racing it's just like it's not about that showing off or it's not about that stuff it's about racing and it's (laughs) like in terms of making a career like it really is about you know the what you can actually offer a, a brand in terms of marketing as opposed to um they're your race results just only especially if you're not actually like winning you know the big races dude i think it's like as valuable now like i mean i look at you look at pretty much all the big guys now like gwyn's got his own youtube channel you know brandon fairclaw's absolutely crushing on youtube he's doing like loads than like his old lockdown rampage series um you know i think more and more people are just going to go that avenue and, and see the see the value in it and i kind of always said from when i started out that whatever racer could make a really cool like video series going into the racing without it affecting their racing i think that would always do really well because people are always looking for like tips or understanding how these riders are so good and trying to get insights into their like lifestyle and the choices that they make and stuff like that yeah it's amazing there's so many more people with YouTube accounts and a lot of them are, you know, big followings. I mean, Fabio Vibner is obviously like just a crazy sort of level, but a lot of the guys now are, have YouTubes and have these big followings and, you know, like it, it must be so valuable, but you always wonder how much of this, like, is there enough to go around? Like I'm always like, Should, you know, they can't wait another one, another one, but it seems like there's such an appetite for it. Yeah, I think people would, like, I guess, especially lockdown and stuff and, like, new people come to the sport, people are wanting to consume that media and, like, they've got extra time on their hands or, like, I even know, like, friends who work in office jobs, they'll be watching, like, YouTube videos when they're working or they'll have it on in the background or whatever as well. And I guess, like, people just like having that background noise. It's the same with listening to podcasts or you know like people like just hearing something else or hearing stories and stuff like that Mm. so getting i think there is definitely just just, i was gonna say yeah just getting a glimpse into into someone else's life yeah like there's always going to be space for it um it's just trying to work out what you can do differently Mm. what do you see then as your as your like what's your mission with your content or what, what do you see as your role in mountain biking i think get more people into the sport 
keep it fun, like educate people, entertain. Um, they're kind of like the main things that I always want to do. Um, tell stories that have like a meaning or like going new places and discovering those trails. Um, I don't know. It's pretty hard. Like it's pretty broad. Like there's parts of it that sometimes they're just really, really fun to create, but they don't always have the most like engagement. And then the things that you're like, oh, that was like quite an easy thing to do. They're the ones that have really big engagement. It's quite funny because like there's a couple of things that I did last year that I spent so long on like working out like working out like sound doing coloring on each like clip and then like it just like wasn't really taken for whatever reason but then you could do like something else and it would have like a hundred thousand views and you'd be like that just doesn't make sense but i guess there is a certain appetite out there that people want and like i guess attention span now like you if you think like people's attention span is so much shorter. Like adverts are short, sharp, really quick. I think that to have people's, like keep the audience engagement for a while is actually pretty hard to do now. Yeah, it's almost, I was watching, a, I don't know if you know them, the Teton Gravity Research, they make like ski videos and stuff, but they, they made, they make some really good documentaries and I was watching, I love their, I absolutely love their channel and they all tell a really good story. Some of the stuff's like an hour long. They're very well produced. Um, and, you know, like I was looking at their, they've got like 250,000, like 300,000 subscribers or something. And, you know, their views, their videos will get, you know, somewhere a little bit above that, maybe like half a million watches or something. And, but they cost a lot of money to produce. And they've obviously like, there's got a lot of people working on them. It takes a lot of time. And you wonder what the future for those things is when, like those kinds of almost art projects, highly produced when some YouTuber can just point a, a camera in front of them uh, or skier or whatever and just like do something that gets millions of views it's it's, I, it's they're both valuable but i hope it doesn't get in the way of the the because it's always going to be more expensive to make those you know uh, more well-produced ones or higher produced ones no i know but you have so much more appreciation for them i feel like like i've got really into like photography and, and video stuff as a result of like creating the youtube channel and i really really enjoy it it's like bikes for me like i'm looking at like camera kit more than i'm looking at like every new bike that like whereas when i was 15 i'd probably look at every single new bike want to know every single spec of every fork that came out and would be totally like oh, should i get this fork should i get that fork what about this what about that whereas now i'm like camera specs um mm. and it's like my that, that's like my new hobby um i hope that there's gonna be a place for like long form stuff and beautifully shot stuff where it's like well directed and like use nice cameras and i really hope there's still going to be space for that because it'd be a real shame to not have both if you know what i mean and i think there is room for both i think there must be i mean it's the same in like tv you know like reality tv came along and um it was like you had people like the game of people producing game of thrones who are spending 10 like by the last season like 10 million dollars an episode and creating this there's just so i can't even i can't even imagine the amount of work that's going into creating just one episode to that and then you've got like the kardashians or something like that which is still uh, there's probably a lot of cameramen and stuff but you know like the the views to input is is like nuts yeah the but there's still a place like off. Off. yeah totally yeah it has changed oh, man. i mean go on yeah it is cool like for the first time i shot like a really cool piece last week with glenn he had like a camera on loan that he wanted to test out and like just seeing the like difference in quality it's just like mind-blowing and i'd like it's just really really cool like the more that you get into like cameras and stuff you appreciate those like little things and like all the workings of it and how you can get better shots and the effort that goes into getting those shots. Um, yeah, it's cool. I really hope that more people do like really nicely shot stuff and, and good stories and things. It'll probably just, I suppose, like anything, it'll just kind of go in and out of fashion. Like as people watch more and more of this more YouTube stuff, then they'll be like, oh, this is so new and different, uh, you know, like this like highly produced kind of thing. Yeah, well, I think it's just, 
the like thing with like reels and like TikTok and stuff where people are like engaging for like super short period of time and it's just like one single clip and it, it I think like I like the idea of it like it's so easy to like scroll through and see like different people doing different things but at the same time like it's so easy just to get caught into it or get stuck and I really hope that doesn't have an effect on like people wanting to do like longer form stuff or yeah it's funny laugh and Blair we were I don't know if you'll like me seeing this or not but his follower account in the last like year and a little bit has increased fourfold I think um and it's because it's partly a lot of it's to do with like in lockdown he couldn't go riding or anything so he's just doing all these jib videos in his garden and it's just like stoppies and like this thing and so now <laughs> now his whole account is basically I'm just posting daily of these like little I think they go well with the reels um and it's a kind of a good example of it's something like he's like you know I think he still enjoys it and stuff but it's 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 interesting you've got like some downhill racer posting like amazing shots of like big whips and you know like like really professionally done and then you've got uh, the thing that actually works in terms of reaching a new audience is is these uh, jibs and and stuff like, that you can just scroll through dude 100 percent, and it's like you know like lachlan and christo are doing like a, a killer job of just like constantly being able to like upload like low short clips and people are just watching them and consuming them all the time Whereas mm. like when you spend like time creating something and then you don't get that, you're like, oh, it's like such a frustrating process, but it's just how the like the algorithms are going and like you just got to go with it as well. And, and like if that's what's working, that's what you've got to do. Yeah, exactly. What's your view? You kind of touched on this earlier on, but what's your view of how social media, because social media has massively changed, not just mountain biking but all sports, probably especially sports uh, that were maybe more niche or more action sports. Um, what's your view of how social media has changed sport and, and mountain biking? Dude, it's like a, I feel like it's probably like a bit of a love-hate relationship. Like, in some ways, I, I like love what it's done. It's been awesome because it's brought the sport to the masses. I think it's definitely become more accepted ask the sport for more people like people will see someone coming down a hill and be like hey mountain biker that's so cool that he can ride that section that we're walking up or like and people accept that they have to share the trails and stuff um i don't really know what the negatives of it really are um yeah i think yeah, it's you only said, a good thing yeah totally you said earlier on you know and it's got more people into the sport and i think you're right it's just increased the, the exposure of off the sport what about as an individual like there's all kinds of uh kind of things going on in terms of like st looking into like the effect of social media on like people's psyche and, and whatever else How, what's your view of someone like who makes a living through social media like do you think there's any like negative impacts on on you i don't think there's negative i certainly don't feel negative impacts like i'm pretty happy and like I quite generally have tried to partner with people that appreciate what I do and like their brands that like I'm invested in time wise and also would go and buy their product. And I feel like comfortable in that position. So I don't feel there's like any negatives. The only negative that I probably ever had was like maybe the second year that I was doing it, I felt really a lot of pressure and it was probably a similar pressure. Like when I was racing, that I wanted to create that content and get it out there. And the pressure of putting that on myself, I was like working harder. Like, you know, I'd be up filming, like I'd say I'd start filming at nine, finish at five. I'd then probably spend another five hours editing at night. And it was just like a, it was like a vicious cycle that was just like unobtainable. Like I really wanted to do it to grow the channel with the best intentions, but just like physically it wasn't possible. And it just like, it beat me up basically. But mm. apart from that, like once I worked out like a good way to do it and I was enjoying creating content, it like gives me a focus. Like I don't think there's a negative. It's just finding that balance where you can still maintain like a, a happy, happy life, I guess, with it. Do you think you're you mentioned when you were racing, you know, you it 
was easy to be quite outcome focused. And the same could definitely be true of creating content and, and putting it out there. The outcome is just, you know, people's engagement with it or, or whatever. Do you think you're better at being more process focused when it comes to like today, like with content creation? Yeah, definitely. Like, dude, it's, it's taken me probably these four years to get to the point where I feel like relaxed about it and I'm not like, oh, like this post hasn't got like this many likes or like, oh, why has that not happened? Like, I'm like, oh, that's like, like, I wouldn't say I'm not bothered by it, but at the same time, I'm like, I really like that piece of content that I created and put out. And like, I like the photo that I took. I like the time that I spent taking it. And like, it's got more of a meaning where it's probably when I first started, I was like, hey, that's our show. I'll do that. Cool. Super. Like really, really happy. And we'd be like, right, I want to get this many views. Why is it not reaching this? What's happened? Like, and I'd probably be like trying to work out why it hadn't made that reach. Whereas now I just, accept it and i'm happy with like if i put something out i'm generally really happy with what it is yeah totally are you still just thinking like of my own because like i've never really used social media very much i've like posted stuff in like every sort of like bits and pieces every now and then but i think in the sort of seven years i've had instagram i've posted like 30 times or something um and part of that is like you know not uh, not really wanting to or not like because it takes time and you just think like I can't really bother or whatever part of it is like this almost inverted ego thing where it's like uh, I don't want to be like seen as being egotistical which is kind of an egotistical thing in, in itself so like I don't want to then put that out there and then part of it as well is like you know just a sort of general fear of like how it's going to be it's like you know, you can't fail if you don't take part or something like that. And I never, I'm always sort of debating about like, about which it is. But I think more recently, uh, I think if it, if you've got something to actually like promote, you know, like with yourself, you, you know, you're, you're wanting to tell stories or whatever. And then it is much easier to just be like, like, I like this. I think this is a good thing that I'm doing. So I can just put it out there and I don't not really worry too much about, about how people are engaging with it. I guess... <sighs> The only, like there's a bit where I struggled because I was like what's the purpose of this and I was like trying to find like what the like reason was and like wanted to like be insightful and share like educational pieces and I think like there's a there's never really been a point where I've just done it for the sake of it like there's always been a purpose to it but I think as you grow older like we we're talking earlier like you I wouldn't even say you become wiser but then you start questioning things in a different way and I was like, hey, what's like the actual purpose to this? Like, what am I doing? Like, how can I make it better? How can I make it that, like, I'm also really happy with, with what I'm doing and the content that I'm putting out, like, I'm appreciating and, and liking. Um, and that was probably the only time that I struggled with it. But once, like, I had, like, a purpose and a goal of what I wanted to do with it, it, it definitely helped. And I try to keep it structured and try to, now I'll try and focus on it being like a job really mm. like try and keep it like you know i'm working like you know nine till like five six o'clock and and trying to keep it like a bit stricter and you know it's nice that i can work at home i can work wherever that if i want to go and change things up then i can do that yeah it's interesting actually i just remembered i had a friend from school that saw a picture of us in uh finale he was like, oh, you know, Scott Lockland. And he was, because he just was getting into, it was interesting, I hadn't seen him in years. And then uh, I, I saw him, he was like, saying like, oh, he's been getting into mountain biking and stuff. Uh, but he's obviously been watching watching your content. And I guess that's where your content is really valuable is it's like for anyone, it was, I mean, it's valuable anyway, but especially for people like getting into the sport or and GMBN's content as well. Like you are like helping, that's kind of what we're trying to do in some ways as well, help people get into the sport which is a great purpose yeah but it's like having it like keeping it relatable and achievable and obtainable like it's something that i've always tried to do because you make it like you know there are some things that are just so far out there like rampage is like a perfect example of it like the probably like 90 percent of people probably more who write are never going to be able to go to rampage and do a run but like it's a cool spectacle right like everyone loves watching rampage seeing the winning run and being like that was just mind-blowing like, 
but at the same time no one like no one's gonna be able to do that where it's like if you're riding trails or like you know whistler is like a good example like everyone wants to go to whistler it's pretty obtainable to a lot of people like you can go there you can take your bike there you know it might be like a once in a lifetime holiday but it, it's something that a lot of people always want to go and do and like the content around that or riding in scotland hmm. yeah you, they can imagine themselves it's in those situations or doing those things whereas rampage is just like i mean most people watch rampage and then just think like like that is insane those guys are have something wrong with them like obviously yeah. i'm not i'm not getting into mountain biking because mountain biking is throwing yourselves off cliffs and i don't want to die <laughs> so i'll just avoid that whereas seeing someone out in scotland or something just enjoying the hills or something in a way that seems reasonable is much more likely to get people into it, i guess yeah and like i enjoy making that content and like want to get people stoked on like whether it's visiting scotland or visiting somewhere that i've been it's always nice like every so often you'll get a comment and they'll be like hey i've just been here like had the time of my life or i went to that like coffee shop that you talked about or whatever and that's like that's like a really nice part of it is getting that like fan feedback and like one-to-one interaction or like a lot of people who follow my content also have scott bikes and they'll message me asking for like you know, a tiny little bit of self advice or, hey, I'm thinking of changing from a spark to a genius or should I get a spark or a genius? Why should I go for one over the other? And it's nice having that like one-to-one interaction with them and like helping them, like, I guess, buy into the brand or be more part of the brand. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm thinking, I've been getting into, I was talking about this in my last podcast, but I was getting into surfing or trying to get into surfing recently. And it's interesting getting into a new sport because you just take for granted that you know what you need to know about mountain biking and whatnot. But I'm just imagining like if you were like a surfer who lived in Scotland, who had a, a following or whatever, and you were like, and you actually interacting with me about like giving me like advice on what boards to get or the places to go, that would be something that, that is really valuable, you know? Yeah. And you would probably take on board like for, you'd buy into that person almost as well because you've appreciated their advice and you'd be like oh i've seen them riding like in people so oh, i'll go and check out where they've been riding in have you more and mm-hmm. like you just got like that in- instant connection and stuff and I, I think that's pretty cool and like being able to help people get out on bikes and keep them stoked is is really nice totally yeah yeah and having that interaction with them does make it kind of like you're accessible to to them yeah and do you know what like when we were talking about the SDAs earlier, it's probably the first time that I've thought about them for a while or like gone back to that like 15 year old self. How crazy is it that back in those days, there wasn't like YouTube, there wasn't Instagram, there was nothing. Like you would have to sometimes send in a piece of paper and you'd be like, okay, the race starts at 8.30 on the 13th of March or whatever. And you'd just, you'd just have to be there. There'd be no like, hey guys, guys the race is up and coming or like this is what you need to bring this weekend the weather is yeah. gonna be like this it's just like you were there yeah how did we learn stuff like I, I was doing the electrics from a van and watching youtube videos to learn how to do it and how that was you could not have done it without that visual um medium of youtube yeah it's crazy i guess it's the same for photos and stuff like i've learned so much by watching youtube tutorials or you know, watching people like who do a similar thing to what I do, but in photography or videography and like learning about how they do it or like doing the same, like following along, doing like settings that they're doing or whatever. And it's pretty crazy that, you know, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, that wasn't even really, a, that wasn't a thing. You'd have to go out and practice or, you know, pay someone or not even pay someone, but you'd have to get tutorials or do something or read books. And now it's yeah, just like, just get it's at it. your fingertips, the information. Yeah, totally. That's, you're sort of, we sort of see the effects of how, like it's having a huge impact on everything, you know, every sport, every um, hobby, at, like every uh, profession. And like, you wonder, yeah, it's, you can't, you wonder just what an impact it is really having. But like, I wonder what the next generation of like riders and racers are going to be like, because like when I was 15, like a backflip was like a, a huge deal if someone did that. Like if like you knew like a friend of a friend who could backflip, you're like, oh yeah, 
I know, I know that guy. I, I know him. But like now, like, you know, in most, in most riding groups, you've like, there'll be someone who can do a backflip. Yeah. And like, just being able to see it probably on social media, like work out how you can do it. And because yeah, you're seeing it, two videos, basis, yeah. like, because you're seeing it on a daily basis, you think it's more accessible. So then people are trying it more like readily, I guess. Mm, totally. Well, we're getting to the, I think, I don't know if we've gone over or not, but to get towards an hour now, I've just got a couple, a couple more questions for you. Um, first is just what your what your plans are for this year if you if you have any uh this year um well we have a baby on the way so that's going to be taken care of and no way congratulations I didn't know taking that. care of june july probably the summer I've yeah that's a couple a of trips that i'm hopefully going to squeeze in depending on covid things um and yeah apart from that dude it would just be scotland stuff really Riding a bit more here, doing some more stuff up north. There's a few trips that I wanted to tick off, and yeah, just carrying on with with content. Totally, that's interesting. Yeah, congratulations. Um, and then the last question is, what advice would you give to a young Scotty Lachlan? Dude, we talked about it so much earlier. It's just like have fun with it. Just like enjoy the moment. Don't get carried away. Just like yeah just be where you are and just like and love what you're doing i think that's a big one like i was always taught that as a kid growing up like you want to love what you do and i do love what i do 100 percent. but i think going back to racing it would be just like just enjoy it just like work on the process don't focus on the goals yeah i think it's so easy as a especially as a teenager just to like each result is just so important and the whole thing just seems it's just out of blown out of proportion in terms of how much each race actually matters and how much each season even matters and that is that's probably what i tell myself as well it's just just chill out <laughs> yeah cool well thank you so much it's been really great to to chat to you and you and we and we really appreciate uh, you coming on thanks nah hopefully we can get out on the trails when when we're allowed and get some riding done absolutely hope so Thanks a lot, Scott. Cheers, guys. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Welcome to the outro. Let's get back to the chair conversation. Shall we? Annalise. Annalise. What do you think about this chair compared with, say, that chair over there? Now, the, bearing in mind this one swivels. And that one doesn't, it's made of wood. The swivel one. See, Annalise likes swivel chairs too. Everyone does, myself, as I've made quite clear. Perhaps more than anyone. <laughs> um, nothing much more to say. Uh, Crystal, still, I still don't like him. Annalise, Got any thoughts on Chris? <laughs> no, okay. It's all right. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Scott Lachlan. Um, and subscribe, please, to our channel. Comment, subscribe. Comments, as I say, is hierarchy sort of starts with uh, we likes, then comments, then subscriptions. Ideally, all three. Um, I also mentioned how, you know, in a previous podcast, I've been subscribing to things because I was always talking about you know, I want you to subscribe. I want you to like and comment. Uh, and then it sort of dawned on me that I don't, I never like, comment, or subscribe on anything. That was old Morgan. New Morgan, obviously, he likes comments and subscribes and, ev and everything because he's learned that it's actually a really good way to live your life. Giving people feedback, subscribing to the things you like, it's very, very positive for me, just my experience, but maybe. Maybe something to consider yourselves. You don't have to, but you know, might might be worth it. Anyway, we have a bunch more uh, derailed stuff coming up. Uh, we've got uh, the trail series obviously going now. Uh, we've got one coming out. I'm not sure if it's next week or the week after with Lachlan Blair. Um, me trying to keep up with him, which was a lot of fun to do. 
We've got way more in the pipeline, so stay tuned for more Thursdays, 6 o'clock. We've got lots more coming. Stay tuned. And thank you so much for watching.